Uh, just before I move into our conversation with uh, Catherine Trebek, who you heard just there at the beginning at the start, uh, just a, a brief overview of what to expect this evening. Uh, this is neither a webinar nor a workshop, but something in between, let's call it an extended conversation. Uh, I'm going to uh, chat with Kate for about 20, 25 minutes, and then you will have the chance to ask any immediate questions. Then we'll break out into rooms so that you can take the discussion a bit deeper through talking and just as important as listening with each other. Uh, and then we'll come back for another chance to share your ideas with Catherine. Is that all clear? Cool. Uh, a couple of words on the elephant, which is a kind of sub, sub project of the Alternative UK. Uh, over the last three years, a UK, us, we've been asking the question, simple question with a multitude of answers. If politics is broken, what's the alternative? Uh, and one thing that became clear to us is that the current politics is part of or is in service to a socioeconomic system that is extremely busy, heedlessly destroying our planet. And we won't be able to deliver a new politics until we have a good sense of the new socioeconomic system that that politics would be part of, would serve, would um, be involved with. So the elephant is the project that tries to name that new next coming system. And the metaphor is obvious. It's the thing that we know is there, but we don't know quite yet how to talk about or grasp or measure or put, even put our hands on or point to. So last December, we gathered 30 people together who we felt had been busy creating that system, but had not yet themselves come together in a unit. So again, like the metaphor, the blind men and the elephant, each one can see a part of it, uh, but none of them could quite see the whole thing. So each episode of this series uh, is us inviting another one of those partially blind men and women that we talked to last December to come and show us their perspective on the elephant um, in the hope that over the whole of the series, we'll be able to piece it together and visualize it in our minds. And so we come to our excellent guest today, Catherine Trebek, who I have known for a while and admired uh, equally over that period. Uh, and I guess the best thing to do, Catherine, to start with is just in one or two minutes, um, introduce yourself to people as if they don't know who you are. So, uh, oh. uh, so I'm an Aussie living in Glasgow, and I'm a, I guess, relapsed academic. Uh, I call myself a political economist. Uh, I heard a beautiful description of that recently of someone saying, economists look at the world or look at the economy without thinking about power and political scientists look at the world and look at politics without thinking about the economy and i like political the idea of putting the two together sort of so the political economy space and sort of that seems more necessary than ever for part of the week my day job is working for the Wellbeing economy alliance and the rest of the week is still doing that sort of stuff but in a, in a different way <laughs> Okay, so what, what is the Wellbeing Economy Alliance? So we call it a collaboration, as in the, the collective noun, a collaboration. Uh, it beautifully shortens to we all, and that sums up the, the intention of what it's about. It was created a couple of years ago from a few folks in the States, in Europe and in the UK, who had been working in different ways on economic system change. So who, in all their different ways, had felt if we're going to have a fighting chance of addressing the multiple challenges facing the world, we have to transform how we do the economy, really seeing the economy as the root cause of many, not, not everything, so not this sort of unilateralist, but the economy does shape a lot of the problems shaping the world. So that recognition that we need to transform the economy. And then these groups said, well, there's lots going on. As you said, busy, there's lots of activity but those groups are inadequately connected. And, and I, the metaphor I describe it as is like rocks in a river when they're separated, the water is of business as usual just carries on around them. But if we can connect them and join them up, then we can change the tide. And so someone said to me, well, that's creating a dam. So maybe the, the metaphor is not entirely brilliant, but you, you get the point in terms of, you know, it's only when we work together and pull our efforts and collaborate and support each other that will have a chance of 
packing a punch in this extraordinary powerful economic system we've got so it's about collaboration amplifying the work of all those actors and so we've now got about 120 130 members from all over the world and they're very very diverse there's young students and young people there's scholars who've been working on these issues for decades there are networks there's business groups there's all sorts of different folks and they've all come together from that shared sense of purpose that we need to change the, the system and they want to work to together to do so how we translate that in practice is through regular connection and conversations so we have monthly calls We've got a We All Youth Network, which we're really proud about. It's young people who have just come come to us and said, you know, these, these banners that we hold up saying system change, not climate change. We want to be part of putting that into practice. We've got geographical hubs bubbling up everywhere. So the Scottish one I'm really proud about is, um, is probably the most advanced, but there's a We All Canada bubbling up. We All New Zealand and Costa Rica, Australia. So there's lots of sort of conversations happening there, just local iterations of that global picture. Mm -hmm. We're working to pull together the knowledge base uh, and synthesize all that known information in, in grey literature that's out there. We're working to connect governments as well through a project called We Go, Wellbeing Economy Governments, that we can talk about. Um, I'm just going to pin you to, to my speaker view. Um, so all sorts of things going going on. So it's been really crazy, <laughs> busy few years. Uh, and we're also working on narratives as well, working with advertising executives and storytellers and so on. And mm. a project we call what, The Greatest Story Never Told. And that's about the, the possibility and the awesomeness of a different way of doing the economy. Okay. I'm going to ask you a sort of a dumb question so you can give me a really sort of clever answer. But you'll, you'll know the old sort of management cliches of what what gets measured gets done mm. and then what gets uh, valued gets measured yes so so if you're building a sort of dam and it has a kind of common logic or a structure to it is one of the things that you want to do is to get people to move away from say measuring the health of an economy by gdp because you know a multiple car crash is an increase in gdp as we all know absolutely um if, if it's you know, if um, if it's proper to pro profitable for you to kill whales, you'll kill whales unless you get a constraint. And a different measurement, you want a different measurement, which is well-being. So give us a simple sense of what the well-being versus GDP. Okay, so this is, is. Um, this is the area that sort of got me into the new economy, well-being economy space is the, the measures of progress. So this is something I'd happily talk about for, for ages. So I, 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 won't, I won't let you talk about it for ages, but a few, <laughs> uh, two minutes would be great. Okay, so in a sense that we've, we have purposed our economy in a way that's measured for faster, faster GDP growth. And as you've already alluded to, there are loads of perverse incentives bound up in that. It, it's it's designed for more and more consumption it's blind to distribution and it doesn't correlate to good lives for people and yet we've put this extraordinary amount of faith as society as policymakers as the media in increasing gdp on the assumption that that will automatically translate to good lives and and yet that assumption has broken down and, and we can go into that perhaps in detail later so if we're going to have a chance at repurposing the economy we need a new measure of progress because that will open up changes at all other layers of the system. It will enable us to incentivize different business models that are more aligned to social and environmental pursuits. It will help us redesign our cities, invest more in prevention rather than treatment. I'm yeah. often thinking if, we're, if, we're, if we keep people more healthy, GDP may actually go down. If we keep people safer in their communities, GDP may go down. So there's a there's a huge perverse logic in what we're, what we're measuring at the moment. And those assumptions that it used to be correlated with good lives in rich countries like the UK certainly no longer apply. There are some countries where if it's used well and in, used to invest in collective institutions, then it can translate to increased social progress. And we can talk about that in, in loads of detail later if folk, folks are interested. But yeah, getting the measures right at the, the macro level, at the economy level, but also I'd say at business level as well. Yeah really important so yeah okay uh, i could ask you a million questions too but i'll try and focus on on, on the urgent ones 
so in a sense, we've been having a conversation about a well-being economy for quite quite a while now, maybe what, 15, 20 years, maybe. Yeah, under various names too. I mean, yeah. and we're not we're not dogmatic that it has to be called the well-being economy. We don't really care actually. But the essence is it's an economy that delivers social justice on a healthy planet. And there's lots of right. movements that would coalesce around different aspects of that. And there's lots of different terminology, whether it's solidarity economy or regenerative economy or sort of purposeful economy or new economy or donut economy. There's lots of different ideas, but they all at their core have, have a really shared sense of social justice and, and sustainability. And so, and you're right, these conversations have been going on for, for decades. We're coming up to the 50 year anniversary of the Limits to Growth report. It's been even mm. longer since Robert Kennedy did his beautiful tirade against GDP. That was the anniversary, 50 years of that was two years ago. And there, ecological economists, feminist economists have been saying for so long about this disconnect between or misalignment between how we do the economy and what people and planet really need. And the urgency of that has just got even even stronger now in the last few months, hasn't it? Not that it well, wasn't before. I'm just about to ask you. So, so it's moving along. Maybe we've had the climate strikes and the youth strikes. We've we have the IPC PC report, and we have a sort of sense in which uh, the limits to growth—that's the great old phrase—are are becoming sharp and obvious. And then someone shifts it up into sixth gear with yeah. COVID, Corona. Um, so just a kind of re just a, a kind of a, a reckoning from you about what the effect of this, and it's not even as if we can say post COVID, post Corona. It's, we don't know whether it's post, mid, early. We really don't know. Yeah, because it could but be twenty COVID thirty seven, COVID eighty three. I mean, was this? No, really, we don't know. So, so just but just any kind of reckoning that you have about how this shutdown and then this destruction of economic value will begin to put more gas in the tank of changing the arguments about how we think, or, or will people just bunker, hunker down? What's your feel I mean, I think to it, progress or regress? It feels really precarious, actually, in, in mm. which way it could go. Um, I have moments where I'm extraordinarily hopeful, uh, and I think the you know that idea of the, the Overton window of what's politically palatable has just been smashed to smithereens, and policy ideas that even two months ago, Pat, you and I would have been dismissed as being naive yes. or idealistic to talk about, are now being enacted by the very governments who would have told us we were being naive and idealistic. And so all bets are off. Um, what's and so that's that's ho hopeful and it means also it's just revealed just how very how very much the, the government can influence the shape of the economy uh, and the, it just shows the reality that the shape of the economy is a political construct uh, and so it means whatever choice whichever road society and economies go down afterwards that is, it's been revealed as, a, as an active choice. We can't say we've sat on our hands, it's inevitable, there's nothing we can do, it's natural, we had no choice in this because the ability and willingness of government to intervene to shape outcomes has been, it's just been laid bare in, and as necessary. So it, it means it's all to play for. Uh, I think what worries me is with, if we go back with old assumptions, you know, that Einstein definition of insanity is thinking you'll change things by using the, the same methods as before. I think there's a real re risk of that, that once the emergency stages or the intensive care stages of the economy, as someone has described it, pass, the default reaction will be, right, dig out those old recipes of, of orthodoxy of the last couple of decades, pump more, more you know, energy into them, more rocket fuel into them, and it won't be back to business as usual. It'll be back to a more potentially more toxic form of business as usual, where mm. environmental standards or labor rights, for example, or social protection mechanisms, there's a risk they could be dismissed as a luxury that we can't afford uh, in the pursuit of just get the economy growing faster, pay down debts, get things back on track. So that's a dystopian <laughs> scenario. Mm. The hopeful scenario is that people will mobilize and will bolster the, the political will and the political appetite and show that we know what needs to change and point to where good practice has already been emerging, if in nascent form, and that we can, I've been using the phrase in Scotland, where we need to double down rather than dial back 
those tentative steps that were going in the right direction. So to me, it feels very, very precarious. And I think a lot of folks feel that way by the fact that so many people working in this space are feeling exhausted and knackered because they're just working so hard. Because I think they feel that pressure that previous financial crisis in 2008, the, you know, the movement mm -hmm. in, the, in the biggest sense of the term blew it. We, we, you know, we collective we, uh, mm -hmm. and weren't able to convincingly make the case for substantial system change. And people are thinking, we cannot let this happen again. The, you know, the planet can't handle it. Communities can't handle it. We, you know, individuals can't handle it. So, yeah, it, it feels and there's a sense of anxiety. I think around what's going to happen. And one of the things I want to ask you from a, an alternative UK perspective is, um, obviously you can wait on the bus of national parliamentary politics to come along for a long, long time. And sometimes the bus just turns away and never turns up at all, or the wrong bus turns up. So on that kind of macro level, um, w one can understand the experience of knocking your head against the wall all the time. You're going you're gonna to get dazed. On the micro level, what's, what's your perspective on the latitude or the requirement for people to sort of start really experimenting with different ideas of the economy, different ideas of how to provide goods and services to each other at a level that's, I mean, we call it semi-anarchistic, but it, 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 there's got to be change that happens from a different place than just gazing at the PowerPoint and saying, will you shift? Is it, so what do you think about that micro level of economics? And people have been experimenting with different ways of doing things for, for a long time. And I think that's why, why I, when I am hopeful, that's where that hope comes from, that we know what change looks like. We know what a wellbeing economy can look like because we see it in microcosm, in the, the community initiatives, the cities that are redesigning themselves for, for more environmental, more community spaces, in the businesses that are designed in a way to deliver social and environmental returns using commercial activity as a vehicle rather than the end in itself. There are hundreds and hundreds of examples around the world that show us what the possibility, the feasibility, the desirability of a different way of, of doing things. And so if you think about that, if I can get really geeky now, that sort of multi-level system perspective where you have the, the sort of the micro level of all the, all the different players, the individual initiatives, and what we see our, our part of the we all, the Wellbeing Economy Alliance's role is to support and connect and help people share and be inspired by and replicate those sorts of practices. Mm -hmm. But we also have a role in channeling the lessons of those up to the policy regime at the mezzi level and say, this is where if I had a slide, I'd, I'd show, show this or a whiteboard. Um, but think about the micro regime and then the policy regime and then the macro purpose of the economy. And so all that's cool stuff that's happening at the micro level, that shows to politicians and policymakers that they better hurry up and support those initiatives rather than having a policy regime that's constraining them. Um, give them a bit more slack, create more supportive incentive system, tax system, and so on. And the mm. proof there, the proof of the possible. But also that policy regime is going to be influenced by what we were talking about earlier in terms of the measure of progress, how we purpose the economy. So all levels of the system matter and all need to interact. And at we all, at one of our strategy days a few, few months ago, we said, well, we're, we're trying to help be the arrows between the layers and between the players. So we're not the rock stars, but we want to help connect and move across that, across that system. Well, you're the roadies. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, that's it. I should have come to you on that one. We call ourselves the amplifiers, though. Um, roadies with amplifiers, that's a well-known <laughs> phenomenon. <that's laughs> right. uh, just two last, two final questions before I open it out to everybody for uh, a Q&A. Um, one, one of the things that you're involved in, uh, in terms of trying to shift, uh, connect up the bottom and the top, well, the micro and the macro is metaphor. Mm -hmm. So, and you'll know of obviously Kate Rayworth's donut economics, and now Amsterdam has become a donut economy. And your thing uh, with your book was arrival. Yeah. So, I, I think the book was called Economics of Arrival, is that right? Yeah, the economics of arrival. And then the subsequent. So just, just, yeah, just say what you mean by arrival and what, how you <laughs> wanted to, to land with people. Yeah, literally to land. So I was speaking, it's when I met for the very first time my co-author Jeremy Williams and I, I was been working at Oxfam for a long time and 
really had a sense that if the work that Oxfam did in countries around the world was going to have a, a fighting chance of being successful in terms of supporting increased living standards in, in supporting communities meet basic needs uh, have agency we needed to really turn our attention to the economic models of the global north because it was the production and consumption and tax behavior of countries like the uk the us australia that were putting so much damage uh, and setting back progress such as it had been in terms of that of you know lifting people um, and supporting people lift themselves out of poverty and so on so we you know, really needed to turn our attention to the the gdp rich world and and jeremy we were just sitting in this cute little cafe in, in London he said well those GDP rich countries just need to recognize that they've arrived and now they need to make themselves at home and actually it's that that's a dual concept that the make yourself mm -hmm. at home is perhaps more important because the arrival idea is right you've got enough but you may not be using it very well you may not be sharing it very well so the key second part of the idea in the book is making yourself at home so it's about improvement, it's about distribution, it's about sharing and cherishing resources better than we currently do. And so the argument is that a country like the UK has arrived because it's got plenty of wealth and resources, but as a society, we're pretty terrible at sharing and cherishing them. So that takes us to a different task. And that's about making ourselves at home with all the different layers of change. And so that would be a well-being economy, an economy that makes itself at home, an economy that gets inside the donut if you like. Um, so lots of ideas around that. And that's partly what we all has been set up to help help bring about. But I, I'm an Aussie, so I'm always using sporting metaphors, actually. And, and, sort of, and, and as someone who travels too, and you know, living in a country the other side of the world from, from home, that idea of arrival and the possibility and that sense of coming home also speaks really profoundly to you know, that sense of contentment and being in, in, in good circumstances. I don't want to romanticize home. There's a lot of homes that are very dangerous places for people. Sure. But, but for those of us who, like me, who are fortunate, when you go home, you feel at peace and you feel you can be who you are. Um, there's a, a TV ad I showed at a conference a few months ago, the housing conference, and it's some, it's apparently he's some famous guy in the US, some wrestler or some fancy dude. And he, it's a, show, a sign of him coming into his big mansion and he starts literally unzipping his skin and he gets smaller and shrinks and, shrinks. and he's there saying, I mean, it's an ad for bloody mortgages or something like or home loans yeah. or something. But the point is, it's the place you can come and kick off your high heel shoes, wipe your makeup off and be, be yourself. And where things are distributed according to need as well. So there's something beautiful about, you know, when homes are a good place. Um, and I don't want to, you know, suggest that they all are, but you know, when homes are working, they're that place where everyone's looked after and taken care of and valued for who they are. And that's quite special, I think. I think it's, um, I'm going to open out now, but just, I'm, I'm just thinking about the amount of people who say we can't use the household as a metaphor for the economy, <laughs> but, but you've flipped it around, <laughs> right? <laughs> you, you, but you've, you've given us a completely different metaphor. Um, okay, everyone, I think you'll all agree that was just fantastic. Um, the way we'd like to do the Q&A is um, there's the chat box, uh, which you see at the bottom. Am I supposed to be doing this? Am I supposed to? Yeah, okay. Um, are, you, are you announcing this, Andrew, or shall I? Well, I've just thought of a, a, of a new way of doing this. Um, oh, if, yeah. Whoever would like to ask a question for Catherine, uh, put your name in the chat box and we'll Pat, you can call on them in the order that they've managed to get their name into the chat box. All right. It's like a, a little race into the chat box. Okay, Lynn, Lynn Franks is straight in there. Lynn, go. <laughs> uh, um, unmute yourself. Okay. Hi, Catherine. Hello. Um, so, um, Catherine, I've been running for the last 20 years based on a book I wrote, uh, a whole um, program and movement of women at the grassroots starting small sustainable businesses. It's called Seed, which I want to talk to you about, not today, about being part of what you're doing. And I'm very good old friends with Indra and, and Pat here. Um, but I just wanted to bring up the women in community. Do you see women with, because um, I do, <laughs> but uh, how do you feel about women in small groups in community taking leadership roles in this new economy, in particularly the sharing economy? I'm not sure there's anything not to love about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, <I'm> just... <laughs> um, I mean, I'm, I'm starting to do a thought experiment of, of things like that, that is there any problem in society that an idea like women supporting each other in communities and starting businesses doesn't play a role in solving? 
uh, and other ideas are things like shorter working week, co-housing, and something I'm, I'm toying with this idea about, you know, are, is there anything not to like about those? I mean, to me, the, the issue of gender inequality is a, a huge part of just how dysfunctional the economic system is and how it doesn't work for enough people, the extent of uh, women being at the very bottom of global labour supply chains, how they're working outside the formal labour market is insufficiently recognised and, and valued, inadequate power of women in, in workplaces, or so many questions that folks on this call will be familiar with. And I wrote a piece at the beginning of the year for the Women's Budget Group who are doing a, a project around a gender equal economy. And we talk in that about the, the wellbeing economy and a gender equal economy being um, sort of nice, nice overlaps. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't, if, I wouldn't say we've achieved a well-being economy if gender inequality is still rife. I mean, to me, it'll be a defining feature of if we have if we have got there. But I also think we will only achieve a well-being economy with women at the vanguard, uh, leading it, working together, being collegial, showing in different ways, but also bringing different values and different ways of working. Uh, so there's a sort of there's an instrumental role, not one uh, as well. You know, we need women to help help lead lead this project, but we also will know we've got there if, if women are uh, at the forefront. A colleague of mine from uh, my Oxfam days in, in South, South Africa used to say that the economy stands on the backs of poor black women. And until we invert that, we'll know we've got a, the fight still on our hands, all of our hands. Beautiful. Brilliant. Thanks for that. Thank um, I'm just going to go through the list of um, names here. Uh, Chris Hanlon, could you make yourself? Unmuted and known, do you want to ask a question? Chris Hanlon. Hi. Yeah? Hi. Hi, Chris. Uh, right. So I'm an ordinary member of the SNP, but I'm pretty involved in uh, internal policy development within the party. Um, I developed the, the policy for the Citizens Assembly. Ah, cool. Um, so, and that's how I ended up following Kate, because she gave a fantastic presentation to the Citizens Assembly. Really good stuff. And what I wanted to ask her is if there's there's often a feeling inside the party that there's a disconnect between policy development and actual outcomes and implementation. And I wanted to ask her how she finds working with the Scottish Government and you know, do they work with her? Is there any frustration on her part? You know, because obviously we are targeting a well-being economy, but how is that working? Does she have any interaction with them? That can be a private conversation as well as a public conversation. <laughs> yeah, do your best, do your best, Catherine. <laughs> Do you know, Chris, a Citizens Assembly was on my mind today because I got the, the survey for participants. So I was filling it in and they said, what's one of your, what was one of the things that was best about it? And, and I wrote, it was, it's, so now you'll be able to tell, the people running it will be able to tell which ones were my answers. Uh, but it was the extraordinary moment of speaking to a hundred people who represent Scotland in that they're, they're, they're a mini Scotland. They were there because they collectively are representative of uh, Scotland's demographics. It was, I got quite emotional actually speaking about it. So thank you for kicking, kicking that off. Um, in terms of working with the Scottish government, it depends who I'm speaking to. I think there are a lot of folks there who absolutely get the, the need for a massive system change and are working very, very hard to bring it about. And I'm thinking particularly, I've worked with folks around the wellbeing economy governance initiative, we go, so that's a Office of the Chief Economist. Uh, and so there's, I see a lot of very, very sincere effort being put into making that project happen. Uh, I also, there, you'll probably be familiar, Chris, with some people in Scotland say, wow, there's nothing happening in Scotland. The, go the government's not doing anything. And I think that's patently un untrue. Um, and someone who's had jobs over the past few years and who works for a global organisation, there is a lot of really, really good stuff happening in Scotland. I'd say, though, it's just not being used to sufficient extent. Uh, so there's almost these tentative steps being taken in the direction that we need to start building a well-being economy. But they're still really tentative. They're baby steps. They're, they're not given the vigour or the oomph that they need to really add up to the system change that's required. So I'm thinking about things like the support that for a long time, Scottish enterprise has given to business models like cooperatives or social enterprises. We need those sorts of business models 
basically to comprise the Scottish economy. I'm thinking about the sustainable procurement work. That needs to be much more punchy. The business pitch needs to be given teeth. Um, the national performance framework needs to align with budgeting. So there's good talk about wellbeing economy and, and folks who aren't from, aren't from Scotland last week, the economy minute or cabinet secretary for the economy uh, stood up and said, the time for a wellbeing economy has well and truly arrived. It was nice her using the title arrived too. Um, and half of me thought, yeah, fantastic. And then the second thought is, I'm not sure she completely really understands the extent of system change we really need to get there. So, but this is not unusual. I mean, Oxfam in its work, where, where I used to work for a long time, you know, and people always talk about the development implementation gap. So Scotland's not alone in this. It means it's all very well to, to get things on the agenda and get rhetoric about a particular way of thinking and a particular goal. The harder task is pinning it down into the sort of change and the extent of change that we need. Uh, so, Chris, I don't know if that aligns with your, your yeah. experience. Sounds like it might. I'm, going, I'm, not, I'm not going to let you answer back, Chris, because we're, we're running out of time and it, we shouldn't be running out of time because of the good bit to come, which is that you'll all at a certain point be broken into breakout rooms so that you can all have a chat with each other. In fact, I think, can we, can we conceivably just do that now, Andrew? Because we're really just a minute away from our deadline. Well, I think you and Hunter should be, since you got in so quickly. No, I know you and my <laughs> great pal, so I'm going to ask you uh -huh. and to not ask another, not ask another Scottish question, but not ask another question until the second part. Okay. I will, I will ask you to ask something on that level because we don't want to out. Because I was also thinking about not just Scotland, but Birmingham, Yorkshire. Very good. What's okay. the quality? What is the quality that's going to, that you choose or from in Somerset? It could be. It's, it's an interesting question as to what is the, the the political community that you motivate best and most effectively. There's, it's not always national governments. It's, it can be a, a, a transnational and super local as well. Yeah, okay. okay, next stage. Excellent. So uh, we're going to go into breakout rooms uh, and there'll be four of you uh, per room. Uh, all you have to do is say yes when we invite you. And oh, well, Patrick's going to ask the questions that we're going to discuss in the breakout well, rooms. Suggest, suggested questions. You're all fantastic and multitudinous, so you can say what you want, but just to... Um, and to just, number one, introduce yourself to each other briefly, briefly, so that you know who we are. Not too long, not too much um, CV parading, please. Thank you. Uh, and then second question would be, um, what kind of economy should come after COVID or mid-COVID or before the next COVID? What kind of economy? And then two, how do we change our motivations to get there? So, you know, how do we develop ourselves or what stories and messages do we try to craft, but how do we motivate ourselves to get to that economy that we want to come out of this particular moment? Is that okay? Worth, worth chewing on? That's okay. good. Okay, okay. Go. here we go. Yeah. See you yeah, in right. another world. Yeah. Hi everyone, we're filtering back from our groups. Hope you've all had as good a conversation as uh, I had, which was absolutely brilliant, between heart intelligence and Cambodian collective trauma. Absolutely. Honestly, where else are you going to get a conversation like this or conversations like these on on 18.02 on a Tuesday evening? There's only no, no other place to be than with the elephant at the alternative. I'm sounding like a DJ and that's po possibly not a surprise. Um, uh, Andrew, give me a wave when everybody is sort of back in the building, as it were, virtual building. Oh, hi. They're back, uh, yeah, I would say they're back. Everybody back, okay. Yeah. Um, all right, well, I'm sure, I hope you all uh, enjoyed it. It's always um, an, an interesting experience to be randomly selected by the Zoom algorithm to talk to these people. Uh, always, always enjoyable for me, but it would be very interesting if there are burning questions that came out of each one of the breakout uh, rooms that you would like to address to Catherine, just to remind you about the questions that you went in with. Um, what kind of economy should come out of this COVID corona moment? And how do we get at our motivations to get to that economy, that next system? How do we develop ourselves or what stories and messages to tell? So 
Um, how shall we do it? Shall people raise their hands or shall, we, shall the, you use the, the, the chat box and you could write your name in? And um, I'll call you out for a question. That might be one way to do it. So we're waiting to see what you... Yeah, I mean, I would say that um, it, as always happens, it's at six o'clock, people have to peel off a um, family and so on. Uh, so since we're all in the space now, I think if we put a hand up, it's more intimate and okay. feels more like a group. So okay. please just put your hands up and Pat, if you can, I'll let you know if you've missed anybody. Okay, um, first question for Catherine is from Rose. Hi, Rose. Unmute yourself and ask away. Hi. Um, it was it was going to be feeding back actually from from oh, our sure. from our feedback group. Feedback question is right, yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. That's cool. Um, hi, Catherine, as well. Kian says hello. Oh, awesome to see you. Give my love back. Yeah. Um, yeah. We did to, to uh, feedback from the group. We had some uh, really lovely discussions um, with Patrick um, and with Charlie, and um, Charlie was giving us some information about some really fantastic uh, community development work that's going on in Northern Ireland. Um, and Patrick um, was. Uh, sort of even back ideas around uh, three projects that he thinks um, have uh, brought together some really interesting alignments on how we could work towards um, sort of future economy. Uh, the Extinction Rebellion um, trusts the people. Um, so looking at enabling, um, yeah, communities, you know, they have the, the full capacity and the abilities to be able to collaborate, to, to build their, their own networks, to build their local economies, to build their businesses. Um, and Charlie was talking about um, uh, the, the kind of supporting cooperatives and social enterprises and that, that builds into um, that process. Um, and the affinity groups Patrick mentioned, you know, these groups that have come out of uh, responding to coronavirus and how communities are, um, you know, caring, they're, they're keeping an eye on each other's well-being, they're making sure people are accessing food, they're making sure people are accessing, you know, medicines. Um, and then flat pack democracy, Patrick was mentioning as well, you know, this, this idea of how, how do we kind of use that as, as a way of linking into local governance while supporting uh, participation in communities. And Charlie had a wonderful word that me and Patrick both loved um, that he was using, which was place shaping, <laughs> um, a, a place shaping process. And that builds in that trust in communities, um, engaging all groups in that kind of collaborative dialogue, which is very much what, you know, you, um, Indra and the Alternative UK and, and everyone is, is exploring as well. Um, so we felt that those those were going to move towards uh, post COVID well being um, economy uh, infrastructure, and I mentioned the need for education. You know, genuinely building that into um, the curriculum. How we got to where we are today, that it is a socially constructed um, way of running our economy, running our political system, and that it can it, it can change. Uh, it isn't static. It's not set in stone. I think that's an important message um, educationally to do. Um, so I hope that kind of adds into some of the other work that uh, you were mentioning, Catherine, around examples that you've come across and everything as well. Catherine, you can respond to that or we can just pile up questions if you want. What would you like to do? Keep going because there's a bit of a theme in that. But... Okay, okay. So um, a, a report back from other groups. So that's a good, another Thank good you. way to do this. Thank you very much, Rose. Anybody else want to do something of a report back from their group? Um, all the hands are low. Or questions to ask? Okay, I'm going to come to you and Hunter because he asked a question before and wasn't wasn't dealt with. So you and the floor, my dear friend. Well, he was dealt yours. with, I thought. <laughs> oh, maybe he was. Okay. <laughs> cut, cut. No, no, no. Revived, revived. <laughs> I've had so, the paddles. I've had the paddles applied. Yeah, so I'm, yes. I'm back to health. Yeah. Hardly. On you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, mate. Um, so, um, yeah, I think so. We we had a really interesting conversation uh, about what kind of economy next, uh, and a little bit on how we motivate ourselves to get there. Um, I think we kind of agreed actually that there's both the micro and and the macro level. The micro stuff. Um, Kerry talked really uh, brilliantly about some of the stuff that's going on in her local area down in Exeter, or in the Exeter area, I should say. Um, and, you know, I know that some of those local initiatives I see mirrored up here in central Scotland where, where I live. So I think I think people across the world are uh, are responding in that way. And I've, um, 
uh, Pat, Pat knows this, but for the wider group, I've been speaking to people across the world um, over the last few weeks, um, and we're releasing some videos called Scotland Calling. Um, we've released Est Estonia and Vietnam, and the Faroe Islands is about to be released next, and we've got a whole series of others. But the point is that around the world, um, uh, countries and people are uh, are reacting like this. They're all reacting locally with little initiatives just to help each other. And it's how we capture that that essence and move forward. And I think um, we all agreed that the kind of economy we want to see next is very much a, a people first economy. Um, and, and just to kind of bring in the, the question which I was going to ask before, uh, Catherine, around, um, you know, I, I like well, everything you were saying before, uh, again, micro and macro level, but how do we influence the culture? Because for me, um, it, is, uh, it is how we change the culture um, from the bottom up. Um, uh, you know, rather than and rather than necessarily tackling the kind of neoliberal approach that the, the, the latest, I suppose, mendacious uh, attack on on society we've seen has been linking GDP with the funding of healthcare. So, so in other words, you know, there's an intrinsic link between your health uh, as an individual, even, and the performance of the economy, and I I, I think that's horrific. Um, but that has been allowed to creep into the conversation the last ten or twelve years. Mm. Um, and so, so my comment is, for those of us who seek to change that, why don't we come at this sideways? Stop trying to meet them head on. Come at it sideways. Use these little, lots of little, little initiatives, um, and suddenly it becomes a tsunami of change that cannot be stopped. It's how, how, how do you guys collectively think that we can uh, coordinate, um, collaborate, uh, and cooperate to make that tsunami happen? I think that's quite substantive between you and, and Roz. Do you want to have a, have a bite at some of that, Catherine? Well, there's heaps, <laughs> heaps there. Yeah. So, I mean, partly you and it's, it's partly why we all was set up was to try and, I guess, mobilise and help the, the sum of the parts add up to something more. And then the, one of the mantras we have at We All is togetherness above agreement, uh, which is lovely to say, really quite hard to do it in, in, in times and it's a conversation we could have, a, have later but that idea that if we if we're all together and focusing on what unites us and sharing hope and adding value to each other so we've set up something a platform called we all citizens where folks from all over the world and it'd be brilliant actually to share some of your scotland calling videos on, on that it's folks from all over the world really diverse just connecting on that, sharing their work, asking for help, uh, exchanging ideas. And so it's about yeah, sharing hope and adding, adding value. I think there's something about mindsets that come from our education system, as, as Ros was talking about, that we've been indoctrinated into what I describe, and it's another geeky moment, a, a narrow cognitive bandwidth of thinking there isn't, that, that you know, the possibility of change is very narrow. Uh, that, of course, we have to grow the economy. It's the only way we'll, we'll create good lives for people. Uh, of course, we have to have more and more productivity. Of course, you know, it's all about uh, nature is an input into the economy. Or, you know, of course, needs, we need to focus on more efficient businesses and all those sorts of sort of orthodox mantras that have constrained our thinking and acted as a straitjacket on politics. And I think education... And across the piece, not just in schools, but in sort of continuing education, informal education, the, the way we just support and open up these conversations to have this idea, this sense of possibility, this sense that there is there is a chance. And I think Rod that speaks to this this I, XR you spoke about trust the people, um, and that to me rings really true because for a long time I've been a a student of deliberative democracy and I've been fortunate through work in the past to be involved in projects that spent a lot of time talking with communities about what really mattered to them here in Scotland then we replicated that project um, with marginalized groups in India so with tribal communities Muslim groups women groups and and um, and, and remote rural communities and that both conversations were about what what do you need, what matters most in life, what do you need to live well, and then a friend of mine replicated the process in Namibia, so really diverse quarters, so from from govern 
to a slum in Delhi, to the heart of, of Namibia. And I watched a video that had come out of the Namibian project um, and it was just voices from, from people that had participated in, the, participated in this conversation. And I had tears pouring down my cheeks because it was almost identical to the video we made of the Scottish project mm -hmm. in terms of what really, really matters to people. And that just, to me, reinforces this reality of this innate humanity that we all share we have, wherever we are in the world. And what matters to us whatever context we're in is our family, our relationships, dignity, purpose. And yet we've got this economic system that we've talked about before is so, so misaligned with that. But there is something really hopeful about that and this extraordinary sense of possibility that comes from that shared connection, that common, common humanity. There's also something, and this comes, I think, from the, the question around how do we move the mindset of, there's something also beautiful that comes from those deliberative discussions and themselves. And so was it Chris um, with the Citizens Assembly? Scholars of deliberative conversations will say, it's not just the results that you get and the outcomes, but there's something beautiful about the process, that community building process, that democratic education. And there's a, a beautiful um, report that I have been quoting for decades from a guy called John Hall, a woman called Louise Ricard. And John Hall now works in the UN um, Human Development Report Department. He's a, a lovely guy. And the phrase they use in this report about these processes of deliberative conversations and deliberative processes to shape our measures of progress, that uh, the sort of thing that I was trying to do in these projects in Scotland and, and in India is the serendipitous benefits that come from that. And that idea of just taking the time to speak to people and give them, put their voices at the forefront of defining what progress is about. Now, there've been enough of this, there's enough people who you know work on this day in, day out that we could probably write what will, the, the outcomes and the detail of what will come out of those conversations. So we know what the, the answers that will be, you know, more, more or less, but the process of going through that really, really matters. And I, I've just submitted a book chapter. It's one of the angriest book chapters I've, I've written. I'm getting a bit ranty in my old age, but it's essentially critiquing a lot of those initiatives in the Beyond GDP movement who I would say are really important and they're taking the conversation on but they are led by elites. So they are led by people sitting in academic corridors saying, here's what progress should be about. Um, and therefore we need to shift GDP to this index. And, and here are the components and I define them and I'm an expert in this. And while they might move the conversation on, what they're not doing is prefiguring the sort of power change that we need. They are not mm. walking the talk. Um, that's a very long, <laughs> long answer. But I think you and there is something about having these processes, these rich conversations, like the Citizens Assembly that that Chris had been been part of that we talked about earlier, and just allowing those serendipitous benefits to bubble up, that will then help change mindsets. And I think Ros's point around education is is absolutely bang on in that. Okay, I I think I think um, given Andrea. Adnan is out with her shovels every day, digging, digging for victory in the alternative UK. I think she should get the next question. So, Indra. One of the problems, Catherine, that, um, that we're facing all the time, uh, and I'm, I, I know that we've been in the same room when we faced this problem, is that the conversation that we're having in this room, for example, mm -hmm. we already agree. And we've already agreed for decades. So what, what is the, um, and, and then very often while we're agreeing, we're also noticing that in this room, we're not diverse or that we are quite similar in, in our culture or that, that, you know, and so on. And there's a talk always of diversity, um, there's something that I can't uh, necessarily put my finger on as an action, but the co-incidence um, right now of the end of COVID and the rise of, you know, what's happened in the States um, and what that has done to challenge people 
almost almost immediately after um, the COVID crisis. So another existential challenge straight after the COVID crisis. Yeah. And I want to somehow to be able to make a link between those two things around how can we actually shift our, you know, this, this holding pattern that we've been in for such a long time. Yeah. So if the holding pattern is that we've, we've known the answers for a long time and yet still, as you said, uh, in many ways, there is no way to walk our talk. We can't become more diverse for one reason or another. And where is the relationship building act that we could still have that might still shift uh, the conversation? And we might end up not having a conversation about the economy at all. Yeah. Uh, we might well just be talking about making relationship, creating well-being across our communities. And I suspect that, hey, presto, <laughs> that will shift something in way because simply because we've not succeeded in doing that before really well. We've talked about it endlessly, not really succeeded. And now what are we possibly waking up to? I mean, I'm sitting here with a young son of 25. He doesn't even know how to put it into words, you know, how he's feeling right now. And it's something in that that I feel still needs to happen that could shift us into this thing that we dream of. I wonder if, you, I, I, and I suspect that you think about this, I know you well enough and I'm hearing all the clues. So I just want to invite you to share something um, around this moment we're in. So oh, there's, there's a lot of probably different reactions and, and sort of different answers to that, to the, the different aspects of your point. I mean, thinking of just watching the US burning, um, at the moment has is so terrifying because a lot of people for a long time have been saying that the US is heading to a civil war and it's very hard not to think we're seeing the early days of that right now. Um, someone who's based just outside Madrid was telling me in the last few weeks instead of singing um, songs to the healthcare workers that they were doing out their windows for the you know for the early stages of lockdown what's happened now is that they've been singing songs from the Franco era. Um, and so there are some very, very alarming is an understatement trends coming. Mm -hmm. And how I was talking yesterday to a colleague who's, who's from New York, how do we provide hope for a young black American? How do you, how do we realistically say your life in two years time might be better? because I'm not sure it will be mm. but because of the, the way society and, and life is going. And then what that sense of um, fear and things getting worse, what that breeds, that sense of hopelessness is that I think just so destructive internally, but destructive to society, but it, I, it's a really, really hard question. And then, yeah, we do have all these conversations like this and like the one in December that you're talking about with, nice people and a lot of sense of agreement. I'm not probably as disparaging them as some of the others were in that room because I do think that this work is really hard. When you're trying to change a system, the system fights back. And I can tell you the war stories about it and I'm sure we've all got the scars of that. And so there is something really important about just having the time to sit back in the armchair of your comrades a bit and have bolstered each, other, each other's resolve, feel that you've got folks on your side, because then when you go off into the different spaces we work in respectively, often they're quite lonely. Um, so I, I do think there's value in, in coming to those spaces, as long as they're not exclusively set up, mm. you know, as long as they're not clubs, you know, show us your, your entry ticket or the special handshake. But I, I, I'm not as disparaging as those spaces where it's, oh, we're all the same here, we all, we all agree with that. Um, and so there's something important, but I do think there's also something important about those messages going out. So, you know, the critique you're preaching to the choir. Well, when we do that, the choir sings more loudly. Um, and then, so there's something important too about really so, sort of getting those people feeling bolder in the messages um, that comes from just sharing them by one degree of separation and another degree of separation. But having said that, that's also why we're putting a lot of effort into our narratives project to communicate this to folk who, who wouldn't join webinars like this, um, who wouldn't come to workshops and conferences, um, to put it into 
everyday language and and you know the advertisers are really good at this um it, i've been despairing in the last few years of how bloody clever advertisers are about speaking to fundamental human needs to sell their products um mm -hmm. one of the examples that walking to to work in glasgow a couple of years ago on the side of a bus it was need a sense of belonging join the british army um, Ray-Ban's latest ad is all about belonging. So if you go into YouTube and put Ray-Ban's belonging, it's a really cool ad actually. It's about belong to your family, belong to your people, belong to your dudes, you know, belong to your community. It's quite a cool beat. And then you get your belonging by having the same sunglasses as everyone else. But that they are tapping into those fundamental human needs that you know, one of my favorite economists, Manfred Max Neef talks about that we heard in Govan in India in Namibia and in so many other places when we have these conversations that need for belonging is one of those aspects of innate humanness that connects us. We need, so the part of the task is to, and then one of the things that's troubled me about that meeting that you're talking about was some of the language we used just seemed so, I mean, I couldn't understand half of it and I work on this stuff every day. And so that's why I think we need to not be so precious and work with advertisers and work with people who, you know, write those a Ray-Ban ads and help them communicate these sorts of conversations to inspire that sense of possibility. Um, and because we do know it can be better because it is getting better in, when places where people are working together and creating those, those micro solutions. Um, so, yeah. And, and your other piece around just starting to do stuff, I think is also, that's the only way we'll keep having agency and not feel hopeless. And it might feel that we're up against it and it might feel that it's not making substantial change, but it's at least the way to feel that we're bringing something positive and that is a huge connector, I think. Time for one more question, one, for one more reasonably big question before we wrap up and it's about, it's about three minutes, three, four minutes. Anybody, anybody's arm shooting up? Otherwise I'm gonna jump in. Uh, nobody, 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 okay. Uh, oh, yes, Patrick, on you go. Um, is that, Pat, I'm cheating here. Um, it's not a question. It's actually just to say that in about a week's time, um, I will have a film available, Creative Commons, and for use in community sharing. And it's in Athens, filmed May last year, and it's Democracy Past, Present, and Future. And you can use it for community screenings. And it really uh, relates to this idea of changing our thinking about agency from mummy, daddy, please be my politician to let's get on with it ourselves. So I, I'll give it to Pat and Indra who I know and um, if they wanna send it out, um, you can use it to community screen. Um, anyway, that's me. Zup. Could we do no. a screening through the alternative, watch it together and then talk about it afterwards? I'd be Let's do it. Let's do it. What a fantastic! That's already being put together as we speak. That great idea. Yes, that's Patrick, already happening. Patrick, it's lovely to meet you. <laughs> yes, hi, Catherine. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, okay. Um, well, can I just ask you one? Well, actually, I wonder if nobody else. You, Maria, would you like to ask a question? If you want, if one's come to mind. Maria's a stalwart um, colleague. Well, I guess I I did have a question in mind, but I feel like. It has in some way already been answered, but one feeling that I have often is that even though I know about lots of alternatives, because I work for the Alternative UK, um, I personally feel really stuck to the old economics. Like, is this glue uh, that kind of follows me around? And even though I've made different decisions in my life about my lifestyle, often I feel like the old economics pulls me a little bit in and I guess I've just wondered like what's your advice for someone who feels like that and then I'll share it with my friends. I would no say pressure, that, no pressure, Catherine, well, at I'd all. I'd say just go gently on yourself because we still haven't yet changed the system and so we're still operating in the confines of the constraints of the old system and so that pushes us to certain behaviours that we, you know, I haven't, you know, whether it's physical infrastructure or something, I haven't yet got, you know, panels on my, solar panels on my roof. Uh, there's, as one example, there are so many areas that we, we can only go so far as in taking individual action within a very, very powerful system that's pushing us, pushing us back. Um, 
so, and I guess that connects to the, the sort of part of the answer to, to Indra's question, those individual actions, even you, though you might feel they're hopeless and they're going against the grain of things, they do, one, they help, hopefully help you feel a bit of agency that at least you're not just sitting back doing nothing. But two, they also have the potential when others emulate them and replicate them to show to politicians that people are taking this seriously. Uh, but things do, things do move through individual actions and, and behavioural change. And there's this wonderful um, term called homophily. And it's the idea that people don't copy celebrities. They copy people in their little like groups who are slightly cooler than them. <laughs> so if you think about a netball team or a group of old boys at the pub, there's always going to be one of them who's slightly cooler and if they adopt a behaviour. And so actually at the, the Citizens Assembly that we were talking about earlier, there was a conversation there from a teacher and she was saying that in her class and in her school, those chilli water bit bottles, you know them, they're sort of really, and then now you can get them all sorts of colors and designs and so on and they're about 25 quid they're quite expensive she was saying that they are really really cool now and so it's they that is now the trend that everyone has to have these chili chili water bottles and and so there's something things move very quickly and so if you can i mean that's just an example of a shifting to water bottles rather than plastic refillables that those little tiny steps you might not know the power of, of them so Maria, you might be a homophily for some groups that you're part of. So don't underestimate the, the power of those, those little changes. Um, but also cut yourself some slack because we haven't yet changed, changed the world. So it's hard to, yeah, it, it's hard to do everything at once when we're still stuck in the old regime. Well, at the, at the end of a powerhouse of a discussion, the injunction for us to cut ourselves some slack, I think, is the perfect <laughs> note on which to end. Um, if you could all wave your hands in gratitude, uh, Catherine, that would be great. Thank you very much. Uh, just to say we are the Alternative UK of www.thealternative.org.uk. We would love you to join us as co-creators. Just go to the front of the website for that or look up uh, the Alternative UK Google. Uh, you probably all are. If you aren't, we very much welcome you. Let's, let's go and fix the broken politics in the craziest of times. Thank you very much, Indra. Thank you very much, Maria. And thank you all for turning up. Um, I'm going to go because I need to go. Uh, but you can all hang on if you want uh, after the appointed deadline, which is now 18.30 and 50 seconds. Thank <laughs> you very much. And we'll see you at the next uh, The Elephant. Thanks, folks. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thanks, Catherine.